A ruler questioned Jesus uh, and saying, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What, what, what can I do to, to go to heaven? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not commit murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And and then the, the guy says to Jesus, well, all, all these things I've kept from my youth, I, I've, I've done that. And Jesus, when he heard this, he, Jesus said back to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor. And you shall have treasure in heaven, and then come follow me. And when the man heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. He was very wealthy. And Jesus looked at him and said, how hard is it for those who, have, who, who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. For it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And then those that heard it said, well, then who can be saved? And Jesus said, the things that are impossible with people are Impos- are possible with God. And, and Peter, Peter said, behold, to Jesus, he said, well, we've left our homes and we have followed you. And Jesus said to the disciples, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times as much at this time and in the age to come eternal life. Boy, there's a lot there. There's a lot there today we're going to talk about in our How Did Jesus series, How Did Jesus Confront Possessions. If you're new to this, maybe today's your first day at at, at Clearview. Today is a a continuation of a a hard look that we're looking into the life of Christ. And we're going, you know, like Jesus, as we say here, Jesus on the street. Jesus in everyday life. And that's one of the things that I love so much about Jesus is he, he didn't stay in a tower. In fact, he left heaven to walk on the pavement with us. And, and, and what could be more every day than bills and money, right? This is just one of those things that, that Jesus looked at head on. And, and what I just read to you is out of Luke chapter 18. If you've got a Bible, turn to Luke chapter 18. If you don't have a Bible, by the way, when you walk in at the chapel or over here, there's always one on the right. You can pick one up. It's free. Take it with you. Please take it with you and, and keep it. Uh, and so this is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. If you're on the U version, it's uh, the New American Standard is the version I'm using if you're going digital today. But this is kind of close to the end of your Bible, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, and then that's where you'll find it, Luke chapter 18. Now, when you read this story, you know, it's kind of kind of interesting here because there's, there's, there's a real crisis that comes. Jesus tells this guy to sell everything he's got. Well, I mean, God's never said that to me, but if he did, you know what I think I would do? Panic. Or I would. I'd be like, hold on. In fact, I would go to most of my Christian friends and they would say, oh, that's not, that's not the Lord. There's just no way God's going to tell you to do that, right? I mean, this is, an, this is a big order, man. This is a really big order. Because here's the reality. There's a couple things we need to point out. One, I do need money. Makes, profit makes the world go round, you know, right? And I do need provisions. I mean, I need a house. It's not fun to sleep in the rain. Done it, not fun. Right? And so I need to have, and, and, and here's the other thing. I, I don't want to be dependent, right? I don't want to be dependent on other people. I don't want other people to have to look out for me and, 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 and pay my way. I don't want to be a, a, a mooch, and, and who does, right? And so, I mean, there's, there's, those are, these are, there's, a real, there's a real tension right here. This is a, this is a tough deal. But this is, this is the haunting thing for me, right? This is the haunting thing for me in this story, is that this guy actually was seeking. I mean, he came to Jesus looking for answers. He really did. He, I mean, in, in, a, in a weird sort of way, this guy had the situational awareness to go, I, I need to be saved. I need eternal life. I need to be saved from this current day, and I need a home in heaven. I mean, so he, you got to give it to the guy. He really was honestly seeking something good. That's the haunting part of this story that I kept asking myself is, I mean, this guy walks right up to the life giver, and then the life giver says, okay, oh, here, here's some things that, that you can do. Well, I've already done those. I've been kind of a good guy most of my life. And, and then Jesus says, yeah, but there's this, there's this one thing. There's this one place. I want you to do that. 
And the question that I keep asking myself is, how do you walk away from that kind of deal? I mean, think about the gravity. Don't, don't read past it. He's looking for eternal life. He goes up to God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, and Jesus says, sure, here's what you got to do. And he says, no thanks. I mean, think about that. He is by default saying, I'll take my chance on hell. And that's, a, that's hard. So how do, you, how do you reject that kind of deal? Well, I can only come up with three possibilities. One, he didn't believe Jesus. Maybe he didn't believe in Jesus. Maybe he didn't believe that Jesus was the Son of God. I don't know. But it sounds like he did believe that, that he, he did have the way. Or two, he feared that it wouldn't work. Maybe if I actually do what Jesus tells me, then, then maybe at the end of it all, I won't have anything that I'm not going to be taken care of. I'm going to sleep in the rain, or I'm not going to have food. All these things start running through his head, which would only be logical for anybody. But then there's this other, what, other thing. What, what, would, what would make a guy reject a deal like that? And I, I think it is more on the bottom there. I think his loyalty was glued to something else. I think his loyalty was, was glued to something else. And there's something that Jesus does right here. I, 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 th now, this is just Jason talking for a minute. I think Jesus, Jesus was baiting, baiting this guy. I, I don't think he was leading him on. I think he was baiting him. He was pulling him out in the open, right? Because notice something that Jesus did right there. When the guy asked him the question in verse, in verse 19, or verse 18, what do I need to do to go to heaven? What do I need to do to have eternal life? And then in verse 20, Jesus says, well, then you know the commandments. And notice that he skips several of them, and he goes right to don't commit adultery. Don't commit murder. Do you notice that he skips the first few? He doesn't start out with the first ones. In fact, the first commandment, he goes right past it. You think Jesus forgot? You think Jesus went, oh, yeah, and by the way, make sure you, like, don't have idols and love God uh, first. No, come on. He knows this guy. He knows what's going on in his heart. Because the first commandment is this one. Look at it. You shall have no other gods before me. Worship the love the Lord your God. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything. In heaven, above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below, you shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I am the Lord your God, and I am a jealous God. So I think Jesus was baiting this guy. I think what he was doing was he was pulling this guy out into center court. He was pulling it out where the light's going to shine because he knew that something else had this guy's loyalty. Something else had this guy's heart. He couldn't walk away from his stuff. And it doesn't make him a bad guy because I want to tell you something. I don't want anybody in this room, I don't want Jesus to ask any of us, I want you to sell it all and sell it today. It's going to get to be a thin crowd in a hurry. So before you get too hard on this fella, hold off. Because it's hard. So Jesus, no, I think Jesus was calling him out into the middle. Because he says, there's one still thing that you lack. In other words, I know what's going on here. This guy had an idol. Now, when we think about idols, I did a whole series on that called Unshackled. If you go to clearview.org, you can pull up the Unshackled series, and we did all those things. And one of the things we kept talking about and as idols is that idols are sneaky things. They're really sneaky. Nobody, I mean, we think of idols and we think of Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, you know, for all of us that grew up in the 80s, you know, and we had this golden monkey head and all this stuff, and we think of all that. No, no, idols, you know, it's not, not just some tribal thing. Idols can look up and they can be in all shapes and sizes, and this guy had split loyalties. In fact, the, I think the reason that he couldn't leave all of his stuff is because he could not trust anybody with his stuff. He'd worked too hard to get it. Many of you have worked really hard to get your stuff. And, and it's not that it's not important, but this guy was self-dependent. And I want to say to you today, if this rich young ruler, he was a kind of a young guy, probably in his 30s, if this guy teaches us anything, if, if we walk away today, if this guy can teach you and I anything, this is what he's going to teach us. 
is that self-dependence leads to self-destruction. Don't forget that. Come Wednesday, come Thursday, come Friday. If you remember anything, you remember that self-dependence leads to self-destruction. So how did, how did Jesus go about confronting possessions? Because he did teach us a couple of things. I mean, there are a couple of things that Jesus teaches us here. And I think the first one is that Jesus never said you couldn't have possessions. Jesus never said, notice, notice that you know what Jesus did not do here, you guys? You know what Jesus did not do? He did not tell everybody, this isn't a blanket commandment to every one of us. No, this went right to this guy's problem. This went right to this guy's issue. Because we've all got stuff that we don't want to give up. So Jesus never, he never said you can't own anything. You know what this, this passage is teaching us? It's, Jesus isn't saying you can't own things. Just make sure that things don't own you. Make sure that things don't own you. Make sure that your money doesn't own you. Make sure that your possessions don't own you. I've been thinking about this verse a lot in the last few days. And it's, it's interesting because I, it, it didn't come to mind until later this week as I was looking at this. And I was reading through some things. And, and I, was, I was reading through this devotional. And, and it, it had nothing to do with possessions. But I think, it, I think the passage has a lot to say to society, about, especially about, about living counterculture. Because what Jesus is telling this guy is it's okay to have things. Make sure they don't own you. This guy was independent. He was self-dependent. And self, being self-dependent will lead you to self-destruction. And this guy, this guy literally chose to, to gamble and roll the dice on, on heaven or hell and let, leave, leave his own powers to himself. Well, that's dangerous. Jesus said in Matthew 7, he said, enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. But the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Let me tell you what, why that verse means a lot to me according to the rich young ruler. Because we are told all of our lives that if you can dream it, you can do it. We are told all of our lives that you should go after whatever you want. We are told all of our lives that, that everything's a possibility. And that sounds to me like a whole lot of a wide road. And the whole world is trying to achieve and achieve. And nothing's wrong with achievement. Jesus never, he never, you know, reigned on the guy's parade of being a good earner. No, what he talked about was what mattered most to him. And what mattered most to this guy was doing it his own way. And everybody wants to do it their own way, Right? We are taught from the time we are little, we are taught that really successful people, I mean really successful people, they're, they're independent. In fact, we even have a word for it, independently wealthy, right? Independently wealthy. I, I love one of my favorite quotes. I, I remember quotes. I don't know why. I can't remember most people's birthdays, but I can remember quotes. And I remember one time reading, uh, you probably heard me say this before, but most likely not. But you'll forget it. Psy psychologists say that uh, you forget 80% of what you hear in the first seven minutes, which makes my job irrelevant uh, in many times. But, but, but nonetheless, when, when John D. Rockefeller died, somebody asked his accountant, how much did John D. leave behind? The guy said, all of it. I love that quote, all of it. You know, see, we are taught from the time we're little to earn, 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 be independent, be independent, be independent. But I'm here to tell you, when you look at the words of Jesus, self-dependence will take you to self-destruction. This guy was not letting go. He wasn't going to let go. I think Jesus can tell us something else about this issue, about self-dependence and idols. Jesus warned us. He warned us. He warned us about the spiritual nature of self-dependence. That was this guy's real problem, the spiritual nature of self-dependence. So, see, what, what's going on right here? Do you notice that Jesus said in verse 25 that it's easier for, this is kind of an, this, uh, uh, a Jew would have laughed at this joke. This is a good joke. He said it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle, right? Like a little sewing needle. There's a lot of discrepancy in history over what Jesus really meant. I would not be alone to say, I think it's just a complete absurdity, is what he's saying. It's hard for somebody with a lot of money to make it. Now, for all of you that have a lot of money, relax, okay? He didn't say it's impossible, he said it's hard. You know why it's hard? Because you worked hard for your money. And you want to provide. 
Nothing wrong with wanting to provide. Every guy in here, man, we're, we grow up, we want to kill it, drag it back to the cave, feed the family. That's what you do. We're, since caveman days, that's what we've done, right? Feed the family. That's why when a man loses his job, he, he about loses his mind. Because there's a thing inside of us that wants to provide. We feel like that's part of our identity. Nothing wrong with that at all. But when you, when you have the ability, have you ever noticed, you ever, am I the only one in the room? Maybe I'm the only one in the room for those of you over there in the chapel. Maybe I'm the only one in the room that I find that sometimes my, my personal internal peace of my soul has tendency to, to flow with the barometer of the bank account. Maybe that's just me. Probably just me. I'm sure it's none of you, right? So maybe y'all can have a group therapy session with me right now, you know? Because I've noticed one of the things I hate about myself Bay counts a little more fat, Jason's okay. When it's not, Jason's not okay, right? That's just life. Jesus knew that. Jesus knew that. But here's, here's the thing. Why is it hard for people with wealth or for people with stuff? And you got to realize, wealth in those days, <laughs> by Williamson County standards, this isn't even about us. We are so much more wealthy than people in those days would have been. If you had a house and a steady job, little hut deal, steady food, you were living. So this, this, this guy, why is it hard? It's hard because our peace goes up and down with our money and we get content and we get, we get a feeling that we're going to be okay as long as we've got more zeros in the bank account at the end of the statement past the decimal, right? So no, what does this guy teach us a lot? Well, he has a lot that he can teach us. But I would tell you this. If, if there's a revelation that can come from this passage, then you, you, you can't read this passage without real really asking yourself a hard question. If you listen to the way people pray, if you start paying attention to the way people pray, they will say things to God like, God, all good things come from you. God, you're the owner of everything. God, you bring it all to me. God, Thank you for all that you give me. I know it all comes from you. Start listening to the way we pray. And when you listen to the way you pray versus a contrast to your ability to trust God with your money, well, it gets painful very quick, doesn't it? Because if God actually is, if God is the generator, stay with me, if God is the generator of the revenue stream, then your ability to let go of your money isn't hard because it was never yours to begin with. And before you go amening that, just realize it's really, see, it's really easy to give God something that was already His. But it's really hard to give God something that you think is yours. And there's a difference. It's really hard to give God something that you think is yours. So what I would say to you when it comes to idolatry and how Jesus dealt with possessions, I would say to you that if you're going to be in Christ, you need to realize that you've been transformed out of the darkness and into the light. Paul uses darkness and light all the time. We, had, we were buried in Christ. We were raised in his resurrection. We were, the old man is dead. The new, the new man, the new woman is up out of the grave. We have all these compare contrasts going on in Scripture about who we were versus who we are. And if we are children of God, and if we're going to call ourselves children of God, and if we're going to call ourselves believers in Jesus, then that means we have a position that I used to be one way, and now I'm another. My position in all of eternity has changed only by the blood of Jesus Christ. So if I am in Christ, then I'm going to say it this way, that my position in Christ means that I'm not possessed by anything but Christ. 
Do you hear me? My position in Christ means that I'm not possessed by anything but Christ. And this guy, this guy, he was full of self-dependence. And that's what got him on the road to self-destruction. He was, he was looking to himself to be his own provider. And you guys, that's the definition of what it means to be carnal. Because you see, we, this guy looked at himself as the, the he, in effect, he was the generator of all the revenue. He was the generator of all the money. He had done it all for himself. And and so Jesus, that's why Jesus talks so much about money. You know, you guys, I've been around here long enough to you guys know that one of, my, one of my favorite bands in the world, probably the favorite band in the world, is U2. I've been listening to, to U2 since I was in the sixth grade, and, and I've just followed those guys forever. And Bono has a famous line in a song where he says, I believe in a God that is not strapped for cash. And Bono's right. I believe in that same God too. But that's not the point of why Jesus talked about I think there's over 2,500 verses in the Bible that deal with money. I think, I'm going to have to check it. But there's, it's everywhere. So if God isn't, if, if he isn't cash deficient, then why in the world would he keep bringing it up? It's not because of him. It's because of us. Because we, look, we will look to our idols. You know what idols do? They overpromise and they underdeliver. They will promise you things they can never bring to you. And so that's why Jesus was calling this guy to trust him. When you look at transformation, when you look at repentance, when you, when you look at somebody giving their life to Christ, Repentance will always find its way to your money. It will always find its way to your money. Because you want God to own all of it. You want God to own all of it. So transformation shows up in your money. Because it's your ability to say to God, I can't control any of this. I don't have job security. I mean, I think I do. But I really don't. I don't have security. I could drop dead with a heart attack before this sermon's over because the preaching's just that good. <laughs> you know, I, I, I could fall out right here. We're not promised anything. Can we at least agree to that? Amen? Amen or oh me, right? Amen. So if God owns it all, I don't have the right to be self-dependent. And I would say to you, friend, you know, all of you have this on your vehicle. All of you have a check engine light. Every one of you. Now, just for, for those of you that aren't mechanically inclined, and that's most people, I just want to give you, I'll give you a little word right here. If that sucker comes on, stop. Just, just stop, call somebody. Because you, you may have seconds, you may have minutes. You might have a day, but most li- that doesn't come on just for no reason. Right? Check engine means your whole world's about to get super hassled all right your whole world's about to get really messed up cancel the day all right cancel your appointments check engine if you really struggle and i have to listen i'm not saying this to make you feel better there's been times i've struggled writing that tithe check going when we get our, when we get our um, contribution statement, we do our tax return every year, I'm like going, okay. You know, it's not easy because we're looking at numbers in front of us, and those numbers don't lie. They don't lie. But I would say to you, if you really struggle in this area, if you struggle with your possessions and you find yourself contemplating this, this is not about your money. It's about do you believe that God is who he says he is or do you not? It's, it, it, it's, it, this is a metaphor. This is a metaphor for who gets to be the CEO of your life. It's not Jesus is my partner. It's that Jesus is my God, and God tells me what to do. This is about submission. 
It was just that money was this guy's problem. And if this is one of your problems, I would say to you, friend, every warning light in your life is going off right now. Every flag should be going off. Every check engine light, every OSHA signal and things back up, you know, beep, 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 warning. Everything in your life is trying to tell you there's an idol that has snuck in. Do you think that idolatry, do you think the devil uses idolatry that knocks on your door saying, hey, I'm here to own you. I'm coming in. Right? Going to take over, destroy your marriage, ruin your children and your grandkids too. In fact, your whole family tree is going to be different one day. No. Don't you wish the devil showed up like that? Then you could go, honey, lock the doors. Right? Right? No, you don't typically know about these things until the light comes on. And for you, some of you today, the light's coming on. And it's not about your money. It's about your dependence on the Lord. I read a book several months ago, and I love what Kyle Eidemann said. It's a, it's a very practical book about idolatry, and this is what Kyle said. He said, you cannot understand the seriousness of idolatry without understanding the jealousy of God. And you cannot understand his jealousy without some understanding of his relentless, powerful love for you. Because they are intertwined. Now let that sit on you for a minute. What, what did the first commandment tell us? Love me only. Because I'm jealous for you. And you know why God is calling some of you into the arena of trust today? Because he loves you that much. For some of you, money doesn't bother you at all. It's something else. But he's calling you into the world of trust. You know why? Because he knows if there's the smallest corner of your heart that you will let that invade, it will take over. Because that's what idols do. That's what they do. Self-dependence will lead you to self-destruction. Self-dependence, friend, it will lead you to self-destruction. It will take you. This guy walked away. He literally turned his back on the life giver. He came to him saying, help me. I want to. Self-dependence will lead you to self-destruction. It will walk you down a path that you cannot come back from unless you have a God. And you're willing to give all of your life to him.